Hey, thank you all for coming. As always, really great to see you. Um, obviously, if you've been coming to some of these former um, lectures we've been running over the last couple of months, or indeed that you've uh, um, you know, just seen them advertised, you will see that most of them were for British universities, pretty much all of them. We had a few Australian universities as well earlier on. Um, but certainly the last five or six have all been from the UK. We're really lucky to have someone from Ireland. And I think that was really important. Obviously, great connections with Ireland through Alice Smith and Malaysia in general. And, and I think it's really important that we continue those. They're fantastic institutions there. And, uh, and Brian, who's been coming to Alice Smith for a number of years, and certainly the five years I've been working there, um, I've been working with Brian. He's been coming out and doing some really interesting presentations. I also think the area here today of the pharmacology is also really interesting too, and is also particularly career-wise, um, something that perhaps sometimes gets overlooked by students and it perhaps shouldn't. So it's another area where I really was glad when Brian got in contact that I was really happy for him to come and present on this again. So I think it's an important area from that point of view. As always, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Then I can give them to Brian at the end of the session. His presentation, as always, will be about half an hour or so. Um, and then we'll have a Q&A after that, whether that's me asking questions, just picking up on things, or anything that you've got to answer as well. Again, as always, it's a unique opportunity to talk to someone who's a real specialist in this area. I know from talking to Brian a lot, career-wise, that's something he knows a lot about as well, not just in Ireland, but also in the UK. So again, if you're looking at it from that perspective, he has quite a lot of information there, okay? I'll stop talking now, hand over to Brian and he can tell you a bit more about RCSI, um, Ireland, and of course, his area of speciality. Well, Brian, thank you. Great, thank you very much, Joe. Um, and uh, good, as almost a good morning, good afternoon to, uh, to, to those of you that have turned up. Um, uh, you, you've, uh, Joe's already mentioned the, uh, the sort of housekeeping rules there. So I'm going to start and talk to you about pharmacy. Um, and you might think the, the, the tagline with that is it may be a little bit controversial. It's my opinion. Um, so I'm allowed to say it. Um, but it's certainly in my mind, pharmacy is a perfect blend of pure science, but also healthcare, um, allowing you to, I suppose, pursue a career in either side. So in, in my case, I'm an academic. I am a pharmacist. Uh, I'm the deputy head of the School of Pharmacy and Biomolecular Sciences in the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. Um, and I've taken a, a research and teaching uh, track in my, um, in my career, but equally I could have gone down multiple different healthcare routes. Uh, I could have gone into the pharmaceutical industry. In fact, I was very, very close uh, to taking a role in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, so there are lots and lots of different options. So as I go through uh, the slides for the next uh, 30 minutes or so, and, and I will try and keep an eye on time, one, to let you answer questions, but two, because I could just talk about this forever um, and you won't appreciate that. Um, so I'll talk in general about pharmacy. I'm not going to really talk about RCSI. I'll, talk, I'll mention it a little bit at the end because um, otherwise my boss would be very unhappy. Uh, but I was asked to come and talk about pharmacy as a, as a career choice, and that's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to talk about the different options that you have, um, and then I'll talk about some of the, because I think the best way to illustrate that is through examples. So I'm going to talk to you about a number of examples of students that have gone through our programme and what they're doing now. Give you an idea of what, what's open to you. So while this isn't interactive, and, and I do miss that, um, I, I, I miss travelling out to uh, to Alice Smith School and, and actually meeting you face to face. Um, but obviously times have changed. Um, and I would normally look for, for a show of hands to see who has drunk the, the drink on the left and usually everybody. Um, and the, then the Agatha Christie uh, novel on the right hand side. So this is a Hercule Poirot novel, uh, but equally she wrote um, uh, other books as well, solving crimes. and. I would ask the question, what, the, what is the link between them? Well, the link is pharmacy, because a pharmacist developed Coke, as we, now, as we know it now. It had a few different names to start with, but it was developed by a, a, by a pharmacist. And similarly, Agatha Christie and her interest in poisons came from working in a pharmacy before she started writing. 
I, I'm not suggesting that uh, you're all going to go out and, and develop a new new type of coke, but it just gives you, I suppose, the idea that there are pharmacists everywhere. You, you just may not realize it. So what does a pharmacist do? And I have a number of different slides on this. Um, and, and so I might go, go back over some stuff again and, and sort of repeat it. Um, but broadly speaking, there are four areas. When, when I was doing my degree, we really only spoke about three areas, which is community pharmacy, hospital pharmacy, and industrial pharmacy. Uh, but now it's, it's recognized that there is a, a fourth area, which certainly in Ireland we call uh, REP, Role Emerging Pharmacy. But we'll start with the, the traditional three, and community pharmacy is the one that, that most people would be familiar with. Uh, so, for example, if you go to Caring, if you go into Guardian, uh, the pharmacist is usually the person down at the back uh, wearing the white coat, and you probably never go near them. Um, there's a number of reasons for that, which I can talk to uh, a little bit later. But basically, this, this is the, your local medicines expert is sitting at the back of the, of the shop. Um, and if you do have questions about your medication or if you are collecting medication, that's who you will get it from. Now, this, the system in Malaysia is slightly different to most other places in the world, although it is changing. Uh, in the vast majority of places, so Ireland, all through Europe, uh, North America, Australia, New Zealand, you go to uh, your, your doctor, your GP, and you get a prescription, and you take that prescription to the pharmacy, and the pharmacist actually checks it and gives you the medication. So you get nothing from the GP. But having lived in, in Malaysia for three years, I know the majority of you probably get your, your medication from the GP. But the question you've got to ask yourself is, well, who's giving you that medication? Is it the, the GP themselves? Probably not. It's probably the person that's working out at the front of the GP surgery, who may be a nurse, uh, but may not be, is definitely not a pharmacist. Um, so if there's a problem, and I'm not saying there, that, that there is, but if there was ever a problem, um, who's, who's going to be the double check? Whereas in, in Ireland and, and all the other countries that I mentioned, you get your prescription from the doctor. They write it according to whatever um, condition that you have. And it goes to the pharmacist and the pharmacist double checks everything. So they will ask you, so what, what is this for? Okay, oh, you've got a chronic kidney disease. Okay, right. And then they will check the dose. They will check that it's appropriate. They will check that you aren't taking anything else. Uh, that would interfere with it. So it's a, it's a really, really important role for patient safety. And it ensures that the patient gets the right medication because if the doctor has made a mistake, then the pharmacist will pick it up. Usually. Again, we're all human, so the odd time it does get through. But at least it reduces the chances of errors and improves healthcare. The other thing about the pharmacist is that they are more accessible. There are so many uh, community pharmacies around. There are, there are single owner uh, community pharmacies. I'm sure we're all familiar with some of those. Um, but then you have the chains as well, such as Caring and Guardian and Watson's. Uh, so there's a pharmacist all, always there. You can, call, you can call in and you can ask questions. So the role of, of the community pharmacist is actually extremely important. Um, and in different parts of the world, even more important, and I'll come to, come to that later by giving you an example of, of what community pharmacists do in Ireland. Another key area then is hospital pharmacy. Unless you have been very ill, you won't have seen a hospital pharmacist. And that's because they're, they're in the background doing their, doing their job. They are supplying medication to the wards. They're supplying medication based on individual patients. They are making up medication specifically for patients. So for example, if, if I was in um, for something, I was in the hospital for, for, for some condition, maybe for surgery or for something else, or even chemotherapy, for example, it is the pharmacy that will make that up specifically for me based on the doctor's directions. So they're able to do sterile preparation and they'll make it up into a, a one liter a bag of saline salt solution, which can be delivered directly into, uh, into a vein 
uh, in the patient. So it's, uh, they're actually making something up specifically for a patient. They're ensuring that the medication is available all around the hospital. There's stock control elements, but also they practice what's called clinical pharmacy. And this is really important. If you think of um, the KL General Hospital, or if you think of, of Pantai, any of the Pantai's, um, they all will practice what's called clinical pharmacy. And essentially what that is, is that you have a pharmacist in charge of one or maybe two or three wards in the hospital. And what they're in charge of is the medication on that ward. So they will review all of the patient's charts and make sure that all of the medication coming from the doctor is appropriate. And uh, to give you an example, I know of, uh, oh, sorry, the other thing that they do, equally important, is that they go on the ward rounds with the doctor. So when the, the, the consultant is doing their rounds, they're meeting all the different patients, um, consulting them before changing a medication, they will consult with the, with the clinical pharmacist as to the appropriate medication. I know a, a consultant in Ireland who will not prescribe anything for a patient on a ward without the clinical pharmacist being there. And he, he has admitted to me that he doesn't feel confident uh, prescribing without the, without the clinical pharmacist there because he acknowledges that the, the pharmacist is the expert in the medication. That is happening in, uh, in, K, uh, in KL, in all the big hospitals, the smaller hospitals, they mightn't have sufficient pharmacists, but it is happening and it's a critical role. But I suppose my point right at the start is you won't know that unless you have been one of those patients that's been very sick and you have seen the pharmacist coming around. But again, a very, very important role. Another aspect then is industrial pharmacy. So the actual manufacture of tablets and capsules the quality control of those. And as an example, there's a role called qualified person, QP, um, and all of the regulatory bodies. So the European Medicines Association, the FDA in the US, they all require there to be what's called a QP, a qualified person within the pharmaceutical company. In fact, usually responsible for just one drug. If, if a company manufactures uh, five or six different medications, you might have a QP in charge of each one. And essentially what they're doing is they are the quality control for that medication. So you might have been uh, manufacturing a batch of medicines over the last week or so. It might have cost you know, two million ringgit more. And it's your job to look at the uh, the, the quality, quality control results, all the analysis, and decide, does this batch of medication meet the requirements for release to the public? So as in, you know, if it says there's 100 milligrams of medication in each dosage form, is there actually 100 milligrams in each dosage form? And this is checked. So it's up to the qualified person to decide, does it meet the requirements or not? And if it doesn't, their role, and this is why it's so important, is to stop the release of that batch, batch of medication. So the company may not be happy because you may, they may have wasted two, three, four million ringgit, but think of it the other way. If you release that batch of medication that isn't up to standard, then you're exposing patients to substandard medication. Maybe there's too much and it could make them ill. Maybe it's, there, there isn't sufficient medication in each dosage form and it doesn't actually cure them of what they're being treated for. So again, a critical role. Also within industry, in, within industry you get research, uh, research into different dosage forms and development of new methods of delivering medication, but also actual new medication. And that leads very nicely then to the sort of fourth area, uh, research and teaching, which is what I have done. Uh, I have. Uh, I don't know, two PhD students in Malaysia at the moment in UPM. Uh, I have one PhD student who has just finished uh, in Ireland uh, and a master's student who has just finished as well. So I'm doing research with them all the time and I'm teaching. Uh, I know pharmacists that have gone into journalism as medical writers. There are pharmacists embedded in 
uh, doctor's practices to actually dispense and do chart reviews, and medication reviews. And then they're involved in governance and safety. So for example, the pharmacy board of Malaysia, uh, who, who would be involved with the, with the different ministries in, uh, I suppose, drugs policies and procurement um, for the whole country. Also the licensing of medication for the country. So a whole range of different roles from patient facing to other roles that aren't patient facing, but also have an impact on patient care. And that's what this, this slide, I think, uh, also illustrates. And I'm not going to go through all of it. I just like the colors. Um, so, so I always insist on using it. But you can see the different areas. And I don't know if my mouse shows up, but you can see here on the left, research, which can lead to drug development and manufacture, clinical trials, testing the, that medication. I was involved in a clinical trial many years ago um, in, a, in a hospital pharmacy in, the, in America. Uh, regulatory approval. So that's where for example, the Pharmacy Board of Malaysia goes, yes, you can have a license to sell and supply this medication in the country. Looking at cost effectiveness. So these are the decisions made where you might have a brand new medication uh, release. And this is a really important role, but also potentially controversial because the public don't understand. But essentially what it is, is looking at a brand new medication. Let's say you have medication A, has just been developed, so it's going to be very expensive. It's going to be a thousand ringgit per dose. But, you can, but it has a, a greater efficacy in treating whatever the condition might be than drug B. So drug A is better than drug B, but drug B costs one tenth of drug A because it, it's not new anymore. It's been around for a number of years, so it costs less. So you can treat more people with drug B compared to drug A. So then what it comes down to is, well, are you able to effectively treat and cure more people with drug A than drug B because drug B doesn't work as well as drug A? And that might sound very confusing, but essentially it's trying to balance the, how much is it, but also how much is it to cure the patients um, and trying to work that out. And so decisions can be made on whether or not to license a product, because yes, this is wonderful, it cures 98% of the people, but actually the other drug, which is much, much cheaper, cures 95% of the people. So you're making a decision on, if we plow all of the money into this new one, then actually we can't treat as many people because we use up all of our money buying this particular drug. So it's all a balance of, of funds. So it's a mix of economics and pharmacy and is actually called pharmacoeconomics. So you have all of these roles in the background that you generally don't see. Then you have community pharmacy, hospital pharmacy that you uh, cer certainly community pharmacy you'll see, hospital pharmacy you might see. And if you go to pharmacy school, then you'll see academics like me. But every single one of these is concerned with efficacy, safe use of medicines, advising on lifestyle, interactions of drugs, uh, reviewing medication, is the patient actually on the right medication? Um, I, I would worry all of you uh, if I described the number of times I have seen mistakes from doctors or a doctor prescribing a medication which can't be prescribed with another medication that the patient is on. So that review of medication is really, really important. But all of that then leads to improved patient care. Thankfully, this is being recognized worldwide now. Um, the, on the left, the image there is the UK National Institute for Clinical Excellence, which describes the role of a, a patient-centered approach. But if you look at, it's all about uh, your medicines and optimizing them. And its pharmacists are central in that. Now that's the UK, but here's the WHO. So in, uh, it was 2016 or 17, actually, I don't recall. Uh, it's very small writing, but I think that might say 2016 down on the bottom. I'd have to take out my glasses to see. Um, but this is their Medication Without Harm initiative, which is all about medicines optimization. And again, it's the pharmacist that is central in that. Um, so th this just kind of summarizes, even from, from a community pharmacy point of view, they optimize the use of medicines. They support people to live healthier lives, public health. 
you don't just get medicines from your pharmacy. You can get health food supplements. You can get vitamins, minerals. You can get other aids to healthy living and really importantly, independent living. So the pharmacist can give advice around managing medications that allows you to stay living independently for longer before, for example, ultimately maybe having to go into a care home if you can't cope with it for yourself. But the pharmacist can provide advice and support to allow that for you to stay independent for a longer period of time. <laughs> Another example as to how they, they impact the, the healthcare system is, is adhering to medication. <coughs> Excuse me, one second. So what I mean by that is asthma is, is readily treatable. Um, if, if anyone listening has asthma, you will probably have a, a blue colored inhaler and you might have a brown colored inhaler. And unfortunately what people do is they generally use the blue colored inhaler because that's the one that relaxes the muscles in the lungs and helps you breathe more easily. But what's happening in the background is that the asthma, the condition itself is still there and it's potentially getting worse. Whereas the brown inhaler, that's the one that actually slows down the swelling and the inflammation that's happening in your lungs. So in the long term, that's actually the, the really important one to keep taking because that's the one that improves the asthma itself. But what you find is that patients quite often don't take that one because they don't feel immediate relief from it. And you don't because it's working in the background over time. Whereas the other, the blue one, if you're feeling tight in your chest, that relaxes your chest and you can breathe more easily. So people go, oh, well, this is the one that works. This is the one I'm going to take. And it has been shown in, in studies that 48% of asthma deaths are due to non-adherence. So basically patients not understanding how to properly take their medication. So they leave themselves at risk of having an asthma attack, which can ultimately be fatal. And the pharmacists have a key role in education and ensuring that patients adhere to their medication. So for example, they'll, they'll keep records uh, in the pharmacy that say when you, when you last got each inhaler. So they can actually monitor, oh, you're getting the blue one a little bit too regularly and you haven't had the brown one for a while. So they know you're not taking it. And then that's a point where you can intervene and advise the patient uh, how to properly take and adhere to the medication. Similar examples with, with diabetes. Uh, patients not taking their medication, and similarly, uh, heart attack, following heart attacks, uh, patients not properly taking their medication. So pharmacists have a, a key role in all of that. In addition, in research, this is just one uh, research project that's going on within RCSI. Um, it's called AMCARE, which is Advanced Materials for Cardiac Regeneration. And basically, they are using uh, stem cells um, with a whole other pilot techniques, which I don't have the time to go into, um, to help to regenerate the heart muscle after a heart attack. So there are pharmacists uh, involved in that. In fact, the lead on that is a, is a pharmacist. So why might you be interested in pharmacy? Well, you get to look at science. There's an awful lot of science. I'm a neuroscientist, so everything I do is related to the brain, uh, particularly Alzheimer's disease and stroke. Um, but I also at the weekends work as a pharmacist. So I get both. I get my science bit, I get the teaching, and I also get to look after patients. So, the, so you can make a significant difference in people's lives. There are medic medicines experts that are trusted by patients and by healthcare. Um, it's all about innovation as well. Uh, the pharmacy is the only a career where you study what's called pharmaceutics, and that's the science of drug dosage form design. Basically, tablets and capsules and all of those that you take, designing new ones of those. It's, it's pharmacists that are involved in those and different ways of getting the drug into the body, such as, for example, patches, um, like your, your nicotine patches and things like that. They are also used for delivering other medications, such as painkillers. 
The other thing is the, the pharmacy degree is, is transportable. Uh, certainly R1 is recognized uh, all throughout Europe. It's rec fully recognized in Malaysia and many other countries around the world. Uh, we have students studied from uh, the US, from Canada, from South Korea, um, where else? Various different countries in Africa, the Middle East. Uh, so, so the program itself is recognized uh, throughout the world in many different countries. So that's my general stuff about, um, about pharmacy and the career, but I'm just gonna, the, the next few slides, before I just talk a tiny bit about RCFI itself, I just want to show you some of our graduates because it's all very well me talking to you and going, oh, well, this is, these are the kinds of things you can do. I'm actually going to show you uh, what some of our graduates have done, just really to illustrate what, what I have been saying. And I haven't picked, aside from one or two, I haven't picked the normal routes, just to show you the, the breadth of opportunity that is there. So this is Fatima Rustam, she's from Qatar. Uh, she graduated, oh, it says it there, 2008. Uh, she was actually our alumni award winner uh, two years ago. So I had the, the pleasure of uh, presenting her with her award. Um, but basically what she, what she did, she uh, came to us, she did her pharmacy degree, and then she did a, a healthcare management master's in RCSI as well. And what she does is she sets up pharmacy departments in hospitals. Um, so I, I, when talking to her, essentially what, what seems to happen is she gets parachuted into a new, new hospital to set up the department and establish it. And then she, gets, she, she sets it up, it runs nicely, and then she gets taken out and put into another hospital to set it up. So she's really gone into to very much into a management role, um, management and establishment of, of pharmacy. The next is Deirdre, who was in our first ever um, pharmacy class. She joins the WHO. Uh, she was also in um, Medicines from Frontier as well. Uh, but she uh, is, is what's called a technical officer, uh, but her area of expertise is in vitro diagnostics. So basically the tests that tell you whether or not you have a particular disease. So one of the areas she knows very well is Ebola and Zika. Uh, so for example, diagnosing uh, she's responsible for the quality of the tests that will tell you, yes, this patient has Ebola or no, this patient does not have Ebola. So she's worked in various different war-torn areas, including Sudan. She's been to uh, many deprived areas, even just to set up uh, pharmacy uh, facilities as well before getting into the, uh, the, the quality testing that she's now doing. Uh, this is Leonard. He works in Ireland. He started as a community pharmacist within the Boots pharmacy chain, uh, but he's now their uh, strategy development manager. So this is looking for new business opportunities uh, within pharmacy. So he's gone from the clinical role into, again, a more management business orientated role. And then we have Ling, who's from Penang. Um, she is in community pharmacy. She stayed in the same community pharmacy where she did her training. They loved her so much, they wanted her to stay. Um, so she's there eight or nine years now um, and is now, uh, now an Irish citizen and, and doesn't need a, a visa or anything like that. Um, but her roles are obviously patient counseling, all the traditional roles that you would expect from a community pharmacy, checking interactions and medications, all of that consulting with healthcare professionals. It's really care of patients in Ireland, certainly, and in fact, most countries this stage, it's very much centered around a healthcare team. So the, no one professional rules, uh, everyone has a voice. So cons consulting with the healthcare professionals, managing minor ailments. So patients in Ireland certainly will come into the pharmacy uh, more often than not before going to the doctor because it's free. You can talk to the, to the pharmacist and if it's something that they can give you from the shop, then they will give it to you and they'll treat it and you don't have to pay uh, to go to your GP. Now, you might be sitting there going, I don't pay anyway. Maybe my parents pay. Well, that's great. I'm now a parent, so I have to pay. Um, and in Ireland, it is 50 euro at least to go and see the doctor. Uh, so multiply it by four point something. So over 200 ringgit just to go and see the doctor. You might, and the doctor might go, oh, I'm very sorry, there's nothing I can do. It's, it's a virus. 
you'll be fine. Whereas if I had gone to the, the pharmacy, they'd have told me the same thing and it wouldn't have cost me the same amount of money. So that's a really important role. And the final one then is vaccine administration, flu, shingles vaccine, pneumococcal vaccine, and now the COVID vaccine. Uh, pharmacists are doing all of that uh, in Ireland. In fact, uh, around the world. So that's just my, my brief, possibly too quick, uh, talk about pharmacy. If you'll indulge me, I'll just tell you a tiny bit about RCSI, um, because while you may have heard the name of RCSI, you probably associate it with medicine, because RCSI has been taking uh, pharmacy students, or sorry, <laughs> medicine students from Malaysia since the 1960s. So we're well used to, to Malaysian students in, in Ireland. In fact, as a, as a general um, group, Southeast Asian students make up about 25% of our student population. But then we have a whole pile of North Americans, whole pile of Middle Easterns, and obviously all the Irish and Europeans. So it's a very multicultural um, setting that, that you could potentially come into. Uh, but we've been around for a very long time. Uh, we, we only have medicine, pharmacy, and physiotherapy. Uh, so we are a, a University of Medicine and Health Sciences. That is actually our official name. You can see it down the bottom right uh, of the screen. Uh, but we're also a postgraduate training body for surgery, for pharmacy, for nursing as well. We're also, I suppose it's important because people think about rankings and, and all of that. We are also very active from a research point of view. We have the highest field weighted citation impact. So that's in the area of relevance. We're the highest in Ireland, uh, and twice the world average. Located in Dublin, uh, I'm gonna, I, I can't see the, the smile on Joe's face, but the Dublin is the capital of Ireland, which is the last English speaking country in Europe. Um, un, unfortunately, of course, the UK has left, um, but getting to Ireland is very, very easy. Uh, Yes, you can take direct flights to, to London uh, and fly on from there, from Heathrow. Uh, personally, anytime I, I went out to Malaysia and I have been out dozens of times now at this stage, as well as living there, I always went through the Middle East. Um, I just found it easier to do two seven hour flights uh, rather than a 13 hour flight and then a, a one hour flight. Um, but Dublin itself is, is a small city. I mean, if you think about the Klang Valley and the population there, uh, the population of KL itself. Um, Dublin is only 1.5 million citizens, and that's quite spread as well. That, that wouldn't be the city centre. Very culturally diverse, very welcoming, uh, warm city, usually very lively, obviously quiet at the moment because of COVID, um, but usually very lively city as well. Uh, as I said, we're singularly focused on health sciences. Uh, largest medical school in Ireland, the top pharmacy school in Ireland, and that's not just me saying it, that's from an independent international review. Um, we're ranked in the top 250 in the world and number one in the world uh, for good health and well-being in the times higher. Um, I mentioned about international students. Uh, we have some of the best facilities, uh, certainly in Europe and definitely in Ireland. We have the largest clinical uh, simulation center in Europe. Um, we have various different learning hubs for students, state-of-the-art sports facilities, because of course it's important to enjoy yourself as well. Um, and because of the international outlook, we, we have alumni all over the world uh, that have graduated um, in, in Ireland. Very, very briefly, in two minutes, if uh, Joe will indulge me, I'll just tell you about the RCSI pharmacy program. <laughs> I've mentioned already that it's uh, ranked number one in Ireland. And that was from this report here, the PEARS report. Um, and they looked at 37 different metrics and RCSI was top in, I think it was 35 or 36 of the 37 sections. Uh, we're also, uh, we also house the Irish Institute of Pharmacy, which looks after uh, the CPD, continuing professional development requirements of all pharmacists. Um, I'm not gonna, and that we have a, a, an integrated program basically what that means is um, we've taken away all the individual subjects like chemistry and um, uh, pharmacology and we've integrated them around systems uh, so around the cardiovascular system or the central nervous system 
Uh, and the other integrated aspect of it is that it is a five-year integrated master's. What that means is that within five years, you do the whole thing. So you do your degree, you do your internship, and you get a master's qualification at the end of it. Um, as, as a comparison, if you look at the UK programs, they are called MFARM. Uh, and I've, I have a slide at the end, if, if someone wants me to look, show it to you, uh, which explains the detail of this, the, the UK programs are called MFARM, but they are actually bachelor's level. So they are a four-year bachelor's program called MFARM, whereas ours is a five-year master's level program. Uh, and the difference comes down in, in, in credits, uh, the number of credits that you're, you're earning. Um, and anyone international uh, are coming to, to study it is entitled, because it's a master's level program, uh, is, a, is eligible for a two-year work visa uh, following on from uh, from the program. So I have other slides on the RCSI program, but I might actually leave it there. I'm just conscious um, that I don't want to talk for too long. Uh, <laughs> I'll get booted out or muted. <laughs> no problem, uh, so gonna, Brian, but it's all been very interesting, so that you, would, you were never going to be uh, edited out, don't worry. Fair enough. <laughs> we were enjoying it. So no no shepherd's crook coming from the side. Not, not just yet, <laughs> not just yet. So yeah, we've probably finished about the right time, just get a few questions in. Yeah, I'm going to so stop sharing, but I can, I can go back and uh, reshare again if, if need be. Okay, fantastic. Well, okay, that was really interesting. I, I think that difference between the, the UK one and the and, and the RCSI model is quite important. I think, yeah. and Brian, just to clear that, that would, in the end, if you were going for the professional route, that would save you a year. Am I right? Um, it's, it depends on how you look at it, to be perfectly honest. So let's say, um, let, let, let's say you were, you're in Malaysia and you're thinking, well, okay, I want to do pharmacy. Um, I'm looking at the UK, oh, Sunderland. And there's nothing wrong with Sunderland. I'm just picking at it because I know people that have gone there. Um, you go to Sunderland, you do your four year M Farm degree. So it's called Master of Pharmacy. Um, you, but you do not stay in the UK for your housemanship. You return to Malaysia for your housemanship. Um, you apply to the pharmacy board and you wait. You could wait six months, you could wait nine months. The last time I checked with any of my colleagues in Malaysia, uh, it was nine months was the waiting list to get your housemanship. You then do your housemanship. And if, if that's a year, you have four years, the year, and in the middle, you're nine months. So five years, nine months, you're a fully qualified pharmacist with a bachelor's degree. Irrespective of what it says, <laughs> it's a bachelor's degree. If you come to Ireland, you do five years in total in Ireland, but in that, so in year four and in part of year five, you do your housemanship. So it's all built into one program. And that's, that's the other integrated part of it. So in that case, in a total of five years, you are a fully qualified pharmacist. If you return to Malaysia at that stage, you are returning as a qualified pharmacist. You're not returning as someone with a pharmacy degree that's not registered as a pharmacist. If you come back from Ireland having done the full five years, you are coming back registered as a pharmacist. So all you need to do in Malaysia then is, is the licensure exam, which everybody has to do anyway. So in, in that case, in five years, as opposed to five years, nine months, you have a master's level degree and you are fully qualified. You've done your housemanship. Okay, fantastic. I think that's pretty clear now. So obviously, if you are very set on this as a route, then obviously this does make quite a lot of sense in, from that point of yeah. view. Um, I, there was a, a question in the chat. Again, just remind everyone, do, do add to the chat as I'm talking. Yeah, I've please got do. Questions for Brian. Um, I, one is the obvious one, which is maybe all the students already know this, but as you may have, uh, am I deliberate um, calling you a, a pharmacologist at the start of the, <laughs> of the conversation? which obviously I did on purpose so that everyone would yep. highlight that it's actually a different thing. So could you very quickly outline for us, Brian, the difference between a pharmacist and a pharmacologist and whether to also sure. cross over? Yeah, absolutely. So pharmacology is, and, and that's what I did my PhD in uh, after I did my pharmacy degree. Pharmacology is one of the core subjects within pharmacy. 
And it is, it is effectively what the drugs do to the body. How, how do drugs work in the body when you take your, your paracetamol? What does it do? How does it get rid of your headache? Um, that's what pharmacology is. It's, it's how the drugs work. The different, I, and, and as that's, that's one of the core subjects within pharmacy. Um, the others in pharmacy would be pharmaceutics, which is how you get the drug into the body. The pharmacologist doesn't care about that. They just want to know that the drug works. Um, the, the pharmaceutics person wants to get it into the body so that it can then work. Um, so all of those are combined within pharmacy and pharmacy is a, is a professional degree. So the only way to work in a pharmacy as a pharmacist or in a hospital or anything like that is with a pharmacy degree. For, with pharmacology, uh, you learn a lot about how the drugs work. Um, subsequently, then your, your, your career options really are research uh, in industry or academia, or possibly going back and doing another degree. Uh, we've had a lot of people with pharmacology degrees come back and study pharmacy because what they actually wanted to do was work as a pharmacist. Um, and, and unfortunately, they got bad advice. Uh, and they went into pharmacology thinking that would lead to the same thing. Is, is, um, there, is there any on, kind of reputational? I, I have to, I see it in some other areas. For example, I think people that are very definitely should be studying business are sometimes told that somehow economics, for example, is, is, a, is a better thing to get with somehow more academic or high, high profile thing. Are you finding that's where the bad advice comes from, that somehow pharmacology is seen as a more I don't know, highbrow for want of a better expression, even though that's inaccurate. Uh, it is, yeah, I don't think, I don't think I'd go highbrow, but it, it's, <laughs> it's, one, it's one aspect that you're looking at in much, much more detail, certainly, because you're spending four years studying pharmacology um, amongst some other subjects. Uh, whereas the five years in pharmacy, it is one of the multiple subjects you would study. Um, in some cases, it could be bad advice. In others, to be perfectly honest, it could be students who aren't sure. They're not sure what they want to do. So they certainly in Ireland, you get the choice. You can do a general science degree. So you would go to uh, one of the larger universities. You would uh, do science. And then you specialize. So maybe in third year uh, of your four year degree, you go, do you know what? Actually, I really like pharmacology. So you specialize then in pharmacology. Um, and then you realize, OK, my career options now are working in a university or working in a research lab uh, or in, you know, in, in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, so then they kind of go, well, you know, I really liked that whole thing about medicines. I'll go back and do pharmacy. Yeah. Uh, so it, 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 it's not necessarily bad advice. It, it may just be as simple as you're 18 or 17. I'm not sure what I want to do yet, which yeah. is fair enough. I think as Brian said, we've got a couple more questions on the chat, which are similar actually, there's a similar vein yeah. to that really. Um, and so one of them is what, what turned you away from pharmaceuticals and more towards pharmacy personally? So this is aimed at you really. What moved you towards one more than the other, do you think? Yeah, that's fair enough. Um, so personally, I, I did my full um, uh, housemanship in a community pharmacy. So dealing with the patients um, and I, I enjoyed it. I, I, I really did. Um, I particularly enjoyed the interaction with patients, feeling that I had helped them. Um, they very rarely came back and said, thank you. Uh, <laughs> but that wasn't what I was looking for. Uh, you know, I felt like I, I was helping them. And the, the bit that, that didn't get me, and it's just it's purely personal, was the business side of things. It just just didn't grab me, you know, uh, so many people in, in my class in pharmacy, and there were 50 of us in the class. Um, the vast majority are are community pharmacists. They own a number of community pharmacies. I mean, I look at the money that they earn and I am jealous. <laughs> um, uh, one of my friends has, has four or five pharmacies. He's a multimillionaire um, and it's fantastic. It just didn't do it for me. I always wanted to get into research. Um, so I did my PhD, I went to Oxford and I did more research there. But while I was there, I realized 
I actually like teaching. So I looked for an academic position then. Uh, so that's that's how I didn't go down the route of community or I, I, I never had the opportunity really of hospital pharmacy. Um, but I knew that it was research I wanted to do. So therefore, uh, that's why I didn't stay in, in community pharmacy. Well, that's a really good answer. And I think it leads to another one of the other questions here. I mean, I think the words multimillionaire may have turned a few heads. Then. So I think having a look at obviously where they're at, where they are now and decisions they might make, one of them is about obviously you've got a lot of students who might be looking at doing a medical degree and that's what they're trying to choose between. So again, we've got a question about what the differences are between a pharmacy degree and a medical degree. Mm. I suppose also that would be the similarities, really. How much, how much is there a crossover in, in terms of content, particularly in the early years, I'd imagine more. But it's, um... Yeah, um, certainly in the early years, there's a good science base to both. There, there would be less, less science in, in the medical degree uh, compared to, to the pharmacy degree. Um, but you know, largely similar to start in certainly in our pharmacy degree, you do anatomy, the same as the same as the medics do. Uh, you do physiology, you're taught chemistry in the early years with the uh, with the medical de medical degree students. But subsequently, because pharmacists need more chemistry, um, they need more pharmacology than than the medical students. So so then it starts to, to branch off in, in different directions. And really, I suppose when you when you come out of your degree, the the, the doctor is or the, the clinician, um, they are the experts in the medical conditions, whereas the pharmacist is the expert in the medicines. So you do need both uh, for for appropriate healthcare. You need you need both of them to work together. Um, I suppose what has always appealed to me is, um, well, certainly the working hours. If you're looking at uh, <laughs> community pharmacy, you're not going to be on call uh, or even hospital pharmacy. You're not going to be on call at three o'clock in the morning at the end of a 36 hour shift. Um, the, the, the route to specialization, I, I, and this is a personal opinion, uh, the route to specialization in medicine I think is is very long and very difficult um, so if if you want to become if you want to become a surgeon you do your your housemanship you then have to certainly in, in Ireland and it, it's largely similar in Malaysia as well um, you work your way through different levels of, of seniority then within the hospital then you get try to get on to a surgical training program to do that you have to be really high flying so while you were acting as a normal uh, house officer a junior house officer senior house officer um, in in the hospital you you have to do research you have to become involved in other things so that when you apply for your surgical training um, place you stand out from all of the other outstanding people and then you go through your surgical training uh, it's a really really long path um, now, when you get to the end of it, uh, yes, there are benefits. You're a consultant. Um, you know, you you can earn a very a, a very good salary. Uh, but in my mind, it 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 was always just too long. <laughs> um, in in pharmacy, uh, you know, if you look at a if you look at a hospital pharmacy, you you're going into effectively public service. So so you're on a on a salary scale, as are the doctors. You know, so that's not going to change dramatically. But if you go into the pharmaceutical industry, then effectively the sky is the limit with regards to what you do. Um, I, I remember having a talk when I was a student from the managing director of Health and Virex in, in Ireland who started as a sales rep. So he was on the road driving from pharmacy to pharmacy, from doctor to doctor, talking to them about, oh, here's our new medicine. Uh, and he he worked his way up to becoming managing director. Uh, so uh, the, the 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 ceiling, as it were, there, there isn't a ceiling. You know, you could you can go further and further. Um, one of the people that was in my class um, works for Pfizer, and she's now in Switzerland. She was in Cork in Ireland for a while. She was in New York. She's now in Switzerland and is extremely senior. Um, 
a lovely person still, which is great, uh, but very, very senior uh, within, within Pfizer. So the, the potential for, for a career, depending on the area you go into, I think is huge in pharmacy. And there are so many different areas, as opposed to specializing in a hospital. You can specialize in a hospital, in a community setting, in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, so I think it just gives you a really good science base with the healthcare and gives you then a, a lot of potential uh, career routes Right, right. Just you mentioned Pfizer there. Obviously, it kind of just leads me to be remiss really not to mention COVID in a, in a conversation itself. I mean, just obviously, has it I mean perhaps the big one is has it changed the industry? Do you think? I mean, is this is this made just simply because of the networks that have been created by this um, uh, different bodies, different governments working together, and distribution networks, so many different things in the industry. I mean, what do you see as the, the effects of this over the next sort of five to ten years? Uh, well, I think it, it, it certainly hit everybody, uh, hit everyone hard right at the start. In fact, it's got worse since then, in a way, um, once we got over the shock of the initial lockdown. Um, but I think what, what, what you've seen is, is the rapid development, for example, of, of the, the vaccines. Um, certainly the Pfizer, BioNTech, Moderna ones, the Johnson Johnson single dose um, the fact that they're all based they're all based on really new technology they're all mrna vaccines rather than the traditional uh one which the astrazeneca oxford one is a is a traditional vaccine um so they they've been developed really really quickly um i think the by necessity all the networks the the uh, yeah, network distribution networks, et cetera, that have been that have been put in place to to allow delivery, I think will change things going forward. Um, in a weird sort of way, it's made the world smaller. Uh, <laughs> we're all suffering the same thing. We all need to get through it in the same way. Um, but I, I, I think uh, if I go slightly off topic, the worrying thing of <laughs> all the people that that are out now not believing in science and not believing in masks and all these conspiracy theory things which are absolutely rubbish. Um, I mean, having seen the impact of, of COVID here, um, you, you know, it, it's, it's not a joke. It's not a conspiracy theory. It's not Bill Gates. It's not 5G. <laughs> it, 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 is a, it is a virus. <laughs> so that's the only other side of it is, is just the, the, the the sort of non-science thing kind of rearing its head uh, all, all of a sudden. But then that's where informed professionals um, such as all of you may well be in the future. That's where you come into play, uh, understanding the science and advising patients. Right. Brian, I've got two more questions. One, yeah. one, one on the same kind of vein and one a bit more prosaic just to finish up with. Um, but just on, on this, on just the continuation of that really, what do you think are the big areas of development then in this industry? What, you know, what, what will it look like in, in, you know, again, 10, 15 years time if we're looking at these graduates coming out and working in the industry? What, what, what kind of differences might there be to the industry at the moment? Well, very interesting because we, we're launching in September a new master's programme. We got uh, some uh, huge funding from the Higher Education Authority. Um, so a grant that I was in, involved in writing. Uh, and, and the title of our application was Enabling Future Pharma Beyond the Pill. Um, and in a weird sort of way, that is actually where, where things are going. It's going down the route of precision medicine. Um, so, so really what that is, is understanding the person's genome, uh, their genetics, and designing a treatment for that patient exclusively for that patient. Now that may still involve uh, tablets, um, but it's it's a, a ta tailored medication for that for that patient. So the precision medicine is going is going to be huge. So medicine based on their genome, uh, big data is is very important. That's also in the new program that we're launching is the, the big data and analytics. So looking at that genomic information, the genetic information, and uh, massive, massive number crunching um, to, to learn more about 
the impact of genomics to allow precision medicine. And then connected health. So digital and connected health. So your, your wearable devices, I don't have a Fitbit or anything like that, but many people do. Um, and and it's, it's the link between that um, informing the patient and informing uh, the, the healthcare professionals, be they pharmacists, be they doctors. Um, I think that, uh, th those sort of three but interlinked areas uh, where, where things are going. That's a brilliant answer. Thank you. I hope that students take that away, really, which is the areas for kind of research and deep personal statements and all the rest of it is all pretty useful stuff to be looking into. Um, just on that, then, Brian, just to finish up, relatively simple question about the actual university, which is just about applying. Yeah. So someone's mentioned UCAS, sure. obviously you're, you're not in the UCAS system, but do you want to just say about the application system very yeah, quickly? Yeah, absolutely. So you apply directly. Um, so you, you, you just apply on the RCSI website, so rcsi.com. And I think one of the tabs is study with us or something like that. Uh, but I can send all of, I can send all of it, this on to you, Joe, um, if, if, you want, if you want to send that around. But basically through, through the RCSI website, um, you're all doing A-levels, so you need ABB uh, to study pharmacy. One of those has to be chemistry. It doesn't have to be the A. Um, you would apply with forecast grades. Um, now, I know you're, you're probably going to get predict, uh, electronic grades or whatever way uh, the A-levels are doing it this year, uh, similar to last year, but you would apply with the forecast ones. Um, and on the basis of that, then you would be offered an interview. Um, and following the interview, then you, you would hopefully be offered a, offered a place. Um, we've had a few A-level students come through and uh, quite often they're, they're top of the class, just they're, they're doing extremely well. <laughs> um, so yeah, apply online with, um, th there's details to fill up, personal details, there's a personal statement, you have to get references. I think it's two referee re reports. Um, and your um, your your forecast results. Uh, we're into applications are open at the moment uh, until early April, um, and we're interviewing all, all all the time at the moment. I have a whole set of interviews uh, scheduled for Thursday, um, so don't waste time if you're interested. That's great. Yeah. So year thirteen, you can if, if there's any of you out there on this call, you can still apply. Obviously, I think most of you are year twelve and below. Obviously, that okay. would be going into yeah. next year and this time next year potentially and, so and, and, and hopefully this, this yeah hopefully this time next year then things are a little bit different to uh to at the moment um you know we we've put i suppose to put your minds at ease we've put a lot of um effort into to safety and, and personal safety precautions around the campus um to allow us to still continue on site uh for some activities uh, and I have to admit, I, I felt uh, when I was in teaching, felt perfectly safe uh, in, in front of the students. Uh, everyone's wearing masks, there's perspex everywhere, hand washing stations everywhere. <laughs> Brilliant. OK, well, thank you, Brian. Listen, thank you very much. Thank you. It was really informative, really fascinating look at a, a really interesting career, really interesting university as well. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you for having me. I've re I really enjoyed it. I, I would have preferred to be there in person, but look, <laughs> maybe next year. <laughs> yeah. Next time you can come and, and it'll be 30 degrees and all the rest of it. And you'll have a Wonderful. lovely time, <laughs> um, as I'm sure you remember very well from your time here. Um, just I as do. always, um, myself, Brian, Nishaz, will just stay on the line for just a minute or so more. If you did just want to ask a question directly, we can answer that. Um, otherwise, as always, good evening. Thank you for coming and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. So if you just want to log off the call now, and if you do want to ask us a question, in which case, turn off your microphone and ask. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Yeah, lots of thanks in the chat there.